What's up, heathens? How ya doing? I'm the Godless Engineer, and I critically analyze apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you could stand up and use your voice. Today, we're going to be analyzing reasons for hope attempting to prove reasonable doubt about radiometric dating. They claim the method can't give us reliable dates, and they have to make a number of assumptions that are going to eventually bite them in the ass. If you want to fuck around and find out how Reasons for Hope attempts to use scientific ignorance to cast doubt on radiometric dating, then please stay tuned. <laughs> Nearly every textbook in science magazine teaches that the Earth is billions of years old, and the primary dating method used for determining this is what is called radioisotope dating, or radiometric dating. Now this is a reliable method for measuring absolute ages of rocks and the age of the Earth, right? Huh. Well, it kind of depends on what you mean by absolute dating. These methods are reliably accurate within a certain margin of error, and the margins of error can change depending on the radioisotopes that are used. For instance, uranium lead dating can be used to date objects between 1 million and 4.5 billion years old. These objects are typically crystals like zircon. The margin of error for this type of dating can be as little as 2 million years. That's a fairly accurate measurement in terms of deep time. First off, many scientists now regard the age of the Earth to be between 4.55 and 4.6 billion years old. Okay, so if this method is reliable and accurate, why the 50 million year discrepancy? That seems like a lot, but let's get into some details here and see what's going on. <laughs> well, the 50 million years is a relatively small margin of error compared to the total time that we're talking about. It actually is only 1.1% of the total time that we're talking about. So it would be 4.5 to 4.6 billion years old, give or take 1.1%. While it may be a long time for us, in terms of how long the Earth has been around or even the age of the universe, it's not that much. And we get this age for the Earth from various sources. Specific meteorites that have crashed into the surface of the Earth give us an excellent source for information. The structure and composition of these meteorites dates back to when the Earth was forming in our solar system. Another source for information are crystals. What we can do is test some of the oldest zircon crystals that we have, and we can come up with a number of about 4.4 billion years old. Keep in mind that there's all kinds of scientific jargon on this topic, and so we'll just present a very straightforward, simplified version of the process. Uh, I mean, it's just basic scientific terms, and you learn a lot of these terms in high school. This kind of makes it a self-burn because they're tacitly admitting that their audience has to lack basic scientific understanding standing in order for their case to seem plausible. But I can assure you, you don't need an advanced education in order to understand basic scientific terms. Radiometric dating is the process of estimating the ages of rocks based on the decay of radioactive elements in them. Basically, there are certain kinds of atoms in nature that are unstable and spontaneously decay into other kinds of atoms. For instance, uranium will radioactively decay through a series of steps until it becomes the stable element called lead. The original element is called the parent element, and the end result is called the daughter element. <laughs> wow! That is actually a coherent and reasonable explanation of radiometric dating. They're probably about to fuck it up, right? Radioisotope dating is commonly used to date igneous rocks, rocks which formed when hot molten material cooled and solidified. I can lick it, I can ride it while you slip it and slide it. I can do all them little tricks and keep the... The dating clock started when the rock cooled. During the molten state, it is assumed that the intense heat forced any gaseous daughter elements to escape. It is assumed that once the rock cooled, you can smack it, you can grip it, you can go down and kiss it, and every time he leave me alone, he always tells me. No more atoms escaped, and any daughter element now found in the rock is a result of radioactive decay since that rock formed. Well, this is correct, although it lacks some important information. This section discusses a situation where you would use potassium argon dating. This dating relies on the initial condition of molten rock consuming organic matter that contains a certain potassium isotope. 
And this isotope will eventually decay into stable argon gas atoms. Now, no argon would be trapped in this molten rock consuming organic matter because, of course, it's gaseous, the rock is hot, it's going to not get trapped inside of this lava flow. So the only thing that's trapped inside the lava flow are things that can escape, which would include this organic matter. So we can reasonably assume that the initial amount of daughter element in this sample is zero. And when we test this sample later, any argon atoms that are found could only be there as a result of the parent element decaying into the daughter element, the argon. Another aspect that should have been highlighted in this section is that Commonly, the type of radiometric dating that is used depends on the sample that you have. If you're dating lava flow, let's say, you're more likely to use potassium argon dating. And if you choose a different sample that's composed and structured in a different way, then you would use a different radiometric dating method. Like uranium lead dating, which is primarily used on crystals like zircon. The reason why uranium lead dating is used on zircon crystals is because when zircon crystals form, they do not accept lead particles into their crystalline structure, but they readily accept and incorporate uranium atoms. So therefore, the initial amount of daughter element in any zircon crystal is going to be zero. So if there's any lead atoms that are detected in a zircon crystal, the only way that they could be there is through the decay of a uranium isotope. Besides this lack of information, which you could make a case that it confuses the conversation, this isn't a completely terrible explanation of radiometric dating. The decay rate is measured in terms of half-life. That is, the length of time it takes half of the remaining atoms of a radioactive parent element to decay. Now, of course, that can be measured in a laboratory, and it is assumed that since we know the decay rate, we can calculate backwards and come up with the age of the rock. Well, calculating backwards isn't exactly the way that I would explain it, but it's not a terrible or incoherent explanation. Good on you, Reasons for Faith. I'm thoroughly surprised by this. Although they are still young Earth creationists, so I really can't fathom as to how they're going to try to turn this around and cast doubt on radiometric dating if they understand the method. Or do they? But is that all there is to it? Here's where it gets tricky. It's true, we can measure a decay rate using observational science, but there's another kind of science that is required to accurately calculate dates for rocks, and that is what we call historical science. Historical science deals with the things in the past, and therefore it cannot be repeated and tested. Dating methods require both types of science. Uh, this sounds like AIG Ken Ham shit right here. Ken Ham is the first one that I've heard using this distinction between historical science and observational science. It's still all science, and just because we can't repeat the conditions or the events of when the crystal formed, that doesn't mean that we can't do science now. AIG will throw out historical science whenever they want to hide their dumbass conclusions behind a veil of ignorance. Because in order to get accurate rock dates, one would have to accurately know both the decay rate and the initial conditions of the rock sample, right? Since radioisotope dating uses both types of science, we can't directly measure the ages of rocks. There are assumptions involved. Well, we do know the decay rates of all the isotopes that we use in radiometric dating methods. We also know the initial conditions of the parent and daughter element due to the conditions in which the samples formed under. Like I explained before, all radiometric dating techniques are used for specific situations where there is no daughter element when it formed or when the sample would have formed. The daughter elements appear over time because of the decay of the parent element. This presenter, for reasons for hope, either doesn't know this information or is willfully repressing it in order to make his conclusion seem more plausible. Ultimately, it makes their entire case incoherent, and they don't want to expose that now, do they? Either way, the assumptions that are made are reasonable assumptions that are logically entailed by the physics of nature. What Reasons for Hope is trying to do is build a case for reasonable doubt about radiometric dating methods, trying to convince you that they're not reliable, or at least cast enough doubt 
on it to make you doubt that they are reliable. A lot of times at this point, some creationists might be like, well, we can date this rock that only formed like 50 years ago and we'll come up with numbers that are in the millions of years or whatever in the hell. But anybody can misuse a tool. And that is the important thing to remember in those particular arguments. Because creationists regularly misuse radiometric dating methods in order to prove that the radiometric dating methods don't work. Like for rocks that formed 50 years ago, you're not really going to be able to use a radiometric dating method like uranium lead or potassium argon because those particular dating methods are useful for older objects. Remember before I said that uranium lead dating is used to date materials between 1 million and 4.5 billion years old. This is due to the half-life and how long the half-lives are for each of these radioisotopes. So you can't just ignore this kind of information and all of this information would be readily accessible in a high school level science class. I mean if Reasons for Hope can prove that there's actually a variable decay rate for radioisotopes then by all means write a paper, submit it to an academic institution, get it published and then you'll probably win a Nobel Prize because that would have sweeping ramifications for the scientific world. So if you have information that shows that there are variable decay rates, then definitely let us know through a publication. Sadly enough, most creationists can only publish through other creationist journals and shit like that. That's because it wouldn't pass muster at real academic institutions and publications. For instance, how do we know what the initial conditions were in the rock sample? How do we know the amounts of parent or daughter elements now in that sample haven't been altered by other processes in the past? How does someone know the decay rate has remained constant since the rock formed? The answer is, they don't. Well, so what other processes would cause a parent element to decay into a daughter element? Or what other process would artificially inject these daughter elements into the sample? What artificial processes or even natural processes would inject lead into zircon crystals? What process, either natural or artificial, would inject argon into these lava flow samples? And this presenter at Reasons for Hope is just saying, well, I don't know if it did happen, but it possibly could happen, therefore it probably did. His entire tactic here is to get you to admit ignorance and then just abandon the methods for no good reason. The fact is that we know the composition of parent and daughter elements in these samples. He just either doesn't know because he won't do the proper research, or he's willfully suppressing this information from us. He's literally banking on the scientific ignorance of his audience in order for his case to even make sense. Let's simplify here and talk about a typical hourglass. Let's say you walk into a room and you see an hourglass with sand at the top and sand at the bottom, and some sand sprinkling from the top chamber to the bottom. Well, observational science would allow us to see and measure the sand, and then calculate how long the hourglass has been running, right? We could make our sand measurements and then calculate when the hourglass was turned over, right? Well, those calculations could be wrong. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how it could be wrong at least in a comparable way to radiometric dating. So ultimately, I have no idea what the fuck he's talking about here. Because we may have failed to consider some major assumptions, like was there any sand at the bottom when the hourglass was turned over? Has any sand been added or taken out of the hourglass? Has the sand always been falling at a constant rate? Since we did not observe the initial conditions when the hourglass started, and we haven't been watching the sand all the time since then, we must make assumptions. Basically, we don't know if someone has tampered with the sample. That is something that we need to control for. And there are ways to determine whether or not a sample was tampered with. Steps are indeed taken in order to protect the samples from either accidental or purposeful exposure. Any lab out there that's processing these samples, if they want to be taken seriously, are going to try to control for any exposure of these samples to the elements. Otherwise, they <clears throat> otherwise there's literally no reason to use those labs and they go out of business so controlling these samples as to not artificially or allow them to be purposefully exposed to certain elements in order to skew the readings is fiscally advantageous for these labs so basically i'm just pointing out 
that all of his concerns have already been addressed. They are non-issues. And like before, he either just doesn't know that they've already been addressed because he won't do the proper research, or he's willfully suppressing this information from us in order to make his case seem more likely. Again, he's leveraging his, again, he's leveraging his audience's scientific ignorance in order to make his case seem reasonable. All three of those assumptions can affect our time calculations. Now, of course, there's more to understanding all of this, but enough said. Well, I mean, yeah, there's always more that you can learn. Like in this video, we didn't cover exactly how or why these radioisotopes are decaying. We also didn't cover the alternative ways in which we can do radiometric dating without using radiometric isotopes in the way that they're currently done. You can actually use methods that require the use of beta and alpha particles in order to, to determine how old a sample is. So not only the video am I responding to, but also my video here is just a brief overview meant to introduce people to this topic. It is in no way meant to be like an in-depth look into radiometric dating. It's merely just responding to easily answerable questions that creationists have that they use in deceptive ways in order to convince the layman population that radiometric dating is not reliable. And all of those things that this guy mentioned in this last section of uh, this video are issues that we have to control for and address. We have to determine whether or not there was any kind of exposure of the samples to any other kind of elements. But we have controlled for that. The labs that process these samples, they do control for those things. And if there is any kind of exposure of these samples, then there are ways to determine that. So all of his concerns have been mitigated. It kind of seems to me that Reasons for Hope just did the basic amount of research needed to understand the basic concepts of radiometric dating at least enough so that they can twist them into trying to convince their audience that seems to lack basic scientific understanding that the radiometric dating methods that we use to determine the ages of certain samples is not not reliable. All in all, I was not convinced by their video. They seem to have enough information to weaponize it and make it dangerous for the general public. As far as like education goes and educating people into ignorance, this video is very dangerous as it misrepresents radiometric dating by leaving out key pieces of information, like the different dating methods, how we actually date these samples, and the initial conditions uh, for which certain radiometric dating methods are used. Of course, this is reasons for hope, and the only reasons that they have are theologically driven, so should we really expect anything better? I don't think so. Thank you, heathens, for joining me today. If you will, please go down below and let me know what you think down in the comment section. Do you have a better explanation for radiometric dating? Do you think that they messed up and I didn't catch it? Let me know down in the comments below, and while you're down there, why don't you smash that like button and subscribe if you like this kind of content. Don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens.